Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dushar. Um, so I'm a PhD student here at Stanford, and I'm going to be talking about Taurus, which is our design for an intelligent data plane. So managing networks is hard, and it's getting even harder. We have a number of different domains popping up that all have different requirements. So something like cloud computing is worried about availability. The Internet of Things operates at a massive scale. AR and VR have very low latency requirements. Um, and these are all managed by network, like human network operators um, using ad hoc tools and scripts. And really, looking forward, we should be moving to more autonomous functionality with learned data-driven algorithms. So stepping back a little bit to today's current uh, network management, approaches are divided into roughly two categories. Um, we have slow and intelligent operation at the control plane and fast but dumb operation at the data plane. So zooming into the data plane a little bit here, a data plane might be responsible for things like congestion control, load balancing, or scheduling, and it operates at the packet granularity. And it's subject to really high performance constraints. So we need nanosecond latency, uh, terabit level um, throughput. And so this kind of restricts the, uh, the model here to using very simplistic heuristics like hashing. Um, ideally, we would have more complex algorithms, but they don't often meet the kind of performance constraints we need here. So moving up to the control plane, we have this slow but intelligent operation where we can do more complex stuff, um, things like anomaly detection, automation, or recommendations. Um, but now, because we have this kind of this path from the data plane to the control plane, we're restricted to operating mostly at the flow level. And so this involves millisecond latency and lower throughput. So I mentioned before, we want to move through to uh, data-driven algorithms. So you can do machine learning here, um, but it's, gonna, it's subject to these kind of slow uh, constraints. So we're forced into this dichotomy here of slow but intelligent and fast but dumb. Ideally, though, what we need is a fast and intelligent platform. And we want it to operate at the packet granularity. And so this is really the crux of what Taurus does. It adds fast intelligence to the data plane. So before I move on, I just want to quickly define what exactly I mean when I keep talking about intelligence here. So as networks become more autonomous and move towards this goal of self-driving networks, um, it's pretty clear that machine learning is going to be crucial here. And so for the purpose of this talk, you can assume that intelligence means machine learning inference. And so this kind of thing is already popping up in a number of network applications, everything from security, control, uh, analytics, all kinds of areas. So as long as we're talking about machine learning, uh, neural networks are all the rage right now. So let's take a look at you know, what kind of things we would do to support this. Um, for those who aren't familiar, the blue nodes here, you can think of these as individual neurons, and they have some set of weights shaped by an optimization algorithm. And to kind of simplify the discussion here, we'll just take a look at one single neuron and what operations this entails. So a single neuron will have some uh, vector of input features coming in that are combined with the neuron's weights and bias uh, in some sort of element-wise multiplication. And then all of this is summed up and passed to some nonlinear activation function. So if this is the kind of operation you're doing and we have these more programmable data planes, um, our first instinct is to try to toss it onto an existing programmable data plane. So this is a pretty simplistic view of what you might have. You'll have some uh, packet parser, match action tables, and a scheduler. Um, but really, this isn't, this isn't uh, doesn't meet the requirements to execute these kind of um, neuron operations, or even more generally machine learning operations, because these tend to have a very high arithmetic intensity. And you run into issues with intermediate storage and communication. And there have been a number of attempts in the literature to try to, try to make this work, but none of them have really been a home run. So in this case, let's take a look at kind of revisiting the problem and how we would properly support these actions. So returning to the single neuron example here, um, we see this element-wise multiplication really falls under the general pattern of a map operation. And then the summation falls under the general reduce pattern. So this is the classic map reduce abstraction. And if we were able to properly support maps and reduces, um, not only do we get single neuron computations, we get full neural networks, and we get any, really any uh, machine learning algorithm which has a basis in linear algebra. And so this is kind of the core element of the Taurus architecture. We take the existing um, programmable data plane entities, like packet parsers, match action tables, traffic managers, but we insert this MapReduce unit into it. 
And so let's take a look at the MapReduce unit, see exactly how this works. So the MapReduce block here is based on um, the plasticine architecture, which is a grid of compute units and memory blocks. And there's a bunch of different units here in this tiling structure, um, but this is really just for scaling out the architecture for bigger and more complex problems. If we go back to our single neuron example, um, we can simplify this to just looking at some compute and some memory. So the memory unit here is just some, just an on-chip SRAM, just a scratch pad, but the compute unit is what's responsible for properly implementing these uh, MapReduce patterns. So zooming into the compute unit here, um, we can see that the compute unit is really just this array of functional units, which does um, arithmetic and bitwise operations and pipeline registers. So the, the horizontally, you can see that the functional units and pipeline registers are organized as lanes, and now all these lanes operate in parallel, while in the vertical, uh, in the vertical organization, you have these stages. And within a stage, all functional units are configured to do the same operation. And so this is where, how you kind of support the map pattern. And um, kind of, we talked a little bit earlier about how the data plane has such high performance constraints. So the point of showing you the internals of the compute unit here is to really show you where the performance comes from. With multiple lanes, we can support, there's parallelism um, vertically here, but even across stages, we can exploit pipeline parallelism. And really, this is the only way to get inference that's operating at the kind of scales that we want. So now that we have the map pattern, we need to deal with the, the reduce pattern. And this is relatively simple. By adding a few um, cross-lane connections here, we can give the, uh, the compute unit the, the, uh, the ability to build reduction trees. And so with that, it's pretty simple. We have the full support for the map reduce pattern. So zooming back out to the overall data plane, uh, Taurus data plane uh, pipeline, um, you can see here what we end up with is a collection of different abstractions and supporting hardware. And so I, I just want to make the point here that the, the machine learning is not here to replace match action or, or like the schedule, programmable schedulers or anything like that. The point here is that you can use these hard, uh, hardware blocks in conjunction with each other. So for an example here, um, you can see the match action tables are actually broken up such that you have a block before the map reduce unit and a block after it. And so because match action tables are a VLIW architecture, you can actually do some really great feature processing using these kind of rules. And then now you have the SIMD spatial architecture of the MapReduce unit, which works in conjunction to perform the actual linear algebra needed to do fast machine learning inference. So um, to make things a little bit more concrete, uh, let's take a look at an example. Um, so anomaly de detection was kind of a driving example for us because um, a lot of anomaly detection approaches use controller-based approaches, which need to operate at the flow level. So you can see kind of the issue here is that you might miss malicious packets. So ideally, you want to be able to examine every packet in the switch. So in this example, say a packet comes in, it hits the, the parser, and so normally the parser is pulling out different headers, um, but in this case, we're actually pulling out features for our machine learning model. So in this case, maybe it's pulling out an IP address. Um, then the packet moves to the pre-processing match action tables, and we can do a couple things here. We can retrieve out-of-network events, say like the failed logins per IP, and so this might be installed by the controller, or we can also do a lot of rule-based data transformations. Um, a simple example here would be turning an IP address into a real value number that can be fed to the ML model. The packet then moves uh, to the MapReduce unit, and this is the area where we will have installed some sort of learned anomaly detection model. So you can think of this as maybe a simple neural network that outputs a one if the packet is anomalous or a zero if it's not. The packet moves then to the post-processing match action tables. And the responsibility here is really just to interpret the results of the ML model. So in this case, you can say uh, if it sees a one as an output from the, the ML model, we should drop the packet because that indicates an anomalous packet. And then finally, the packet moves to standard traffic manager, which is responsible for sending the packet to the correct destination. So as long as we're talking about anomaly detection, we did some evaluation with actual machine learning anomaly detection models that showed up in the literature. And so we have one model here with, uh, that's based on support vector machines and one that's based on a deep neural net. And um, when implemented with the Taurus MapReduce block, 
um, we get, uh, we're able to maintain a throughput of one gigapacket per second, which is in line with um, existing data, uh, programmable data plane hardware. This was the kind of line rate that things like the RMT paper, the PIFO paper were targeting. And so it doesn't come for free, but the overheads are pretty minimal. You still, you're only adding latency in the nanosecond range. Um, area overhead is pretty minor, and the power overhead is uh, single digits. So you get a lot of performance for very little cost here. So because Torus is a data plane architecture, it means you can also use it at the NIC as well as the switch. And our test case here for evaluation was the Indigo Congestion Control Network. So this is an LSTM network that is making uh, updates to the congestion window. And in the original paper, because it was implemented in software on general purpose hardware, um, the update interval is restricted to 10 milliseconds. Um, but we live in a world where we have microsecond scale events, and you need a much finer granularity of, uh, granularity of update if you want to be able to react properly. And so Taurus allows you to drive this interval down to 12.5 nanoseconds, which is more than enough for microsecond scale events. So in this case, um, we have, uh, when we implemented the LSTM network, um, we had it running at 80 million packets per second, which corresponds to about 40 gigabits per second for minimum size packets. Um, you have similar latency and power overheads, but you do pay a little bit more cost in terms of area because LSTMs tend to be a little bit more heavy duty networks. So kind of to, to wrap up here, um, Taurus is a proposal for um, adding intelligence to the data plane, in this case, machine learning inference, and it does this by adding the map and reduce primitives and support for these primitives into a typical PISA-like architecture. And so this allows us to run machine learning inference at line rate within the data plane, and it gives us orders of magnitude improvement over existing controller-based approaches. And a lot of the, the um, existing like, work in the community has been on taking fixed function hardware and moving it towards a more programmable substrate. Um, but now we should also be looking at how to kind of extend the capabilities of the data plane while maintaining that same pr uh, programmability. And this is really what Taurus aims to do in the context of machine learning. So uh, thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. There's some questions in the back. Yeah, so um, kind of, so the way we did it for the sake of testing it here, um, this MapReduce unit is based on an architecture called Plasticine, which was uh, published a few years back. And so that's programmed with a high level hardware description language called Spatial. And so we were able to use that same language here. And so the, the purpose of that language is that um, it implements loops and controllers with these parallel pattern primitives. So uh, a, a loop is defined as a for each or map operation or a reduce operation. And so this gives us uh, an easy way to kind of program this. And in terms of working with P4, you could see this as like an extern function calling these kind of things. But really, P4 is a, a combination of different abstractions, right? You have a parser block, a control block for your, your Ingress pipeline, a control block for your Ingress pipeline. So it's not, I don't think it's really out of the realm of possibility to have additional control blocks implementing different abstractions like MapReduce. Uh, on, on which target hardware did you take the measurements that you showed? On which? What? The measurements that you showed, the timing, mm -hmm. on which hardware did you? Oh, so uh, all of this is done in simulation. Um, so we don't, we don't have an actual physical chip for this. Um, but we have a, like, a cycle accurate simulator. Model sim or something. Sorry? Which simulator did you use? A register? A tra a tra sorry, this model sim or what was it? Oh, well, we have our own uh, custom simulation. So the plasticine architecture was also developed in the same group I'm in. So they've developed the whole uh, language and compiler infrastructure. So we were able to, to take that and use that for our evaluation. Um, it's all public and open. I'm happy to give you the GitHub links and paper references. Thanks, yeah. Oh, sorry. There's more questions in the back. Uh, just, oh, so you were able to do training before installing the, the actual 
uh, model onto this, the chip. Yeah. Is it possible to update that model with learning as packets are processed? Yeah, so this is something we're looking at now. So the, the first step here was, like you said, um, focusing on trading offline and then moving the model onto the chip. Um, but what you could do, there's a, there's a number of tricks you can play here. You can have the, um, the updates install at very coarse intervals. Um, so you might have slightly stale weights, but you're still getting some element of online learning um, if you're worried about the bandwidth of sending the entire, uh, all the gradient updates over, um, there are, there's literature that talks about doing partial gradient updates and kind of accumulating the gradient over time so you get a slight gradual increase in performance. So there are a number of tricks there to do that, but in this context, uh, it's easiest to assume training offline and then inference on chip. Any more questions before the final uh, short talk session? Thank you.